Hey, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Good to see you. Thank you for staying in this service, all right? Uh, we have three services started last week, and last week, this one was packed out, all right? Uh, tons of people in here, tons of people downstairs. It looks like some people moved to our other two services. So you guys can keep coming to this service. You're good, okay? Just want to let you know that. And I know some of you are asking, like, where's the big tent? It's coming back next week. So uh, it's coming back, so don't worry. We want to make sure you're covered and shaded outside in the front, but it'll be back with us on next Sunday. Uh, last week, Joel started out our series called Love Agents, and as he started it, he talked about his love for the Mission Impossible movie franchise, and, and I love those movies too, instead maybe Mission Impossible 3, I tried to watch it again not too long ago, and it, it was just terrible, so I didn't even finish it, but otherwise I think the rest of them are, are pretty, pretty good. I think though the greatest Mission Impossible this time of year is trying to find propane tanks for your grill, right? I mean, the weather is, is warmer, and it's grilling season, and everybody's out trying to find their propane tanks, but it feels like mission impossible. Now, why is this mission impossible? Well, when it gets warm outside, we start inviting people over to our homes. And when we start inviting people over to our homes, what we usually like to do is we like to grill out. And so I, I kind of see the grill as symbolic of relationships for us. Because if you think about it, you invite somebody over, you're going to grill out for them, you're going to grill hamburgers or steaks or seafood, and some of you do like tofu burgers, which I don't think it counts, but you do that kind of thing. And, um, and, and we do this because we bring people together, we, we eat together, we connect together, we interact together, we share stories together, we talk about life together over something as simple as a grill. Well, today, as we continue our series called Love Agents, we're going to talk about something that we see Jesus do over and over again that's pretty simple. Now, it's not a grill, but it's food. That over and over again, when we look at Scripture and we see the life of Jesus, we see that he interacts with people over food. And in those moments where he's, where he's eating with them, he influences their lives, not just for a moment, but oftentimes for eternity. And so we're going to focus on the power of a meal today as we continue this series. And today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 9, starting with verse 9. Here's what it says. It says, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Let me give a little bit of context of where we are in this particular story here in Matthew chapter 9. We're in this fishing village known as Capernaum. Uh, at that point in time, probably had a population of about 1,500 people. It's set there on uh, the coast of the Sea of Galilee, and it was really situated in a pretty unique spot because this was a place that was on this travel and trade route from Syria to, to Egypt. We've got a photo here, I think, or an image of um, that particular area. I think you can see Capernaum there where the Sea of Galilee is. It's in this perfect spot here. Again, that yellow line is this trade and travel route that was very, very popular. Plus, it's set right on this, this border. And, and so for Capernaum, this was a perfect place to collect taxes because you always had travelers and people coming through with trade and whatever it may be. And so they would collect customs taxes there as you were entering Capernaum and as you were leaving Capernaum. I kind of equate Capernaum to be the Delaware of the Middle East at that time, right? If you've ever traveled up and down 95, you know when you go into Delaware and go out of Delaware, you always pay a tax. And so I kind of imagine that that's kind of what this place is like. So it's a perfect place to collect these custom taxes, but it also sits there on the Sea of Galilee. And so there were a lot of fishing companies who were there too. And so as they would go out and they would, they would catch fish, they'd bring them back in, and then they'd have to pay taxes on the fish that they, they caught. Well, in this town of Capernaum, there's a guy whose name is Matthew, and his job is to collect these taxes. And because of the job he has, the people there do not like Matthew very much. One, it's because he's a tax collector, and tax collectors in those days, they were notorious for being told, hey, here's the taxes you need to collect. And so they would go to you and say, here's what we need to collect. But that number was usually a little bit more exorbitant than it needed to be. And 
And so they were known to be extortionists. And so this is how they padded their, their pockets. This is how they became wealthy, was taking more money than they really needed to take. And so people didn't like them for that reason. But they also didn't like them because of who they worked for. Uh, here, Matthew would have worked for Herod Antipas. He was the ruler over this particular region of Israel. And then that Herod worked very closely with Rome. And so because of this relationship that was there, and because Matthew worked with Herod, they didn't care for Matthew at all. In fact, Matthew was probably hated by the majority of the people. And that meant that Matthew had very few friends. But in the midst of this work day and doing the work that he feels like he's supposed to be doing, Jesus shows up. Look at the rest of verse 9. It says, follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Now up until this point in the story, we don't know that Matthew has had any kind of interaction with Jesus there in Capernaum. Now, it is important to know that Capernaum actually was kind of like Jesus' headquarters, if you will. It became his hometown. And so they would travel back and forth to all these different places, but they would come back to Capernaum to be with family and to be with friends. And so Matthew's probably seen Jesus around. Maybe he's heard Jesus before. Maybe he's even seen some things that, that he's done with other people. But, but I'm guessing that, that Matthew just kind of looks at Jesus as, you know, just some religious dude. But Jesus shows up, comes to Matthew, and says, Matthew, follow me. And Matthew does something pretty incredible. He, he stops what he's doing. He quits his job, and he goes to follow Jesus. And you think about that part of the story, it's like, ah, that's amazing that he would, he would take this step. But, but I don't even think this is the most interesting part of the story. See, when we look at, at Matthew, Matthew is an outsider in that culture. He works with Herod in Rome, so he was seen as being unpatriotic by the other Jewish people. The work that he does, it's labeled unclean by the religious leaders, and so Matthew was the type of person you weren't supposed to even be around. And then, then you've got his work ethics, right? He's overcharging people for their taxes, and so people feel like he cheats them out of everything that they've worked so hard for. Here's Matthew. He's an outcast. He's an outsider. But Jesus comes to him and asks him to follow Jesus. Like you think about that, there's, there's something powerful in God, or excuse me, in Jesus coming to Matthew and saying, Matthew, follow me. And we're talking about love agents in this series. And so if we kind of look at this first verse here in Matthew chapter 9, I think it gives us sort of a quick glimpse into what being a love agent is. Here, here's the first thing that I would throw out this morning is that love agents have a hit list. Hey, we can't talk about spy movies and have spy music and Mission Impossible and 007 and not have a hit list, right? Now, the difference is we're not talking about people we go out and kill, okay? Let me just make that clear to you. Some of you, that might be your job. You do what you need to do to feed your family. But that's not what we're, we're talking about right here. If we go back and we look at Matthew, I don't think this is the first time Jesus has ever seen Matthew. I don't think this was a day Jesus is like, oh, man, I got to go over here and Matthew's going to charge me taxes you know what, I'm just going to pick this random tax collector to follow me. I don't think that was the case at all. Again, this is Jesus' new hometown. This is where kind of his headquarters are for his ministry, if you will. And so he's regularly there in Capernaum. And guess who he'd probably see on a regular basis in a place like that? This guy named Matthew. And, and so when I, I think about this interaction that Jesus has with with Matthew, I believe Matthew has been a target of Jesus all along. That Jesus has seen Matthew and sees something in him that he says, that's the guy that I want to be a part of my team. When you think about your own life, who's the person God is putting in front of you to connect with? Like Joel started this last week and started talking about this part of this, this series. And he, and he said, being a love agent means starting with prayer. That when we're a follower of Christ and we're called to be a love agent in the world, that it really does begin with prayer. And, 
And, and as Joel was talking, he said, hey, pray for that person that God will put on your heart and your soul that you need to build this relationship with. And if you began to pray that prayer last week, I bet a, a face or name of someone has popped into your mind. And whoever that person may be, again, put them on this hit list. Now, let me clarify something when I say hit list. This does not mean someone you are trying to turn into a follower of Christ, okay? That's not what we're talking about here. This is someone that you get to spend time with and interact with and build a relationship with. And in some way, God will use you to influence this person's life. And so for you, who is that person? And I bet if you're praying that prayer, what you're going to find is God's going to put a Matthew on your heart to build a relationship with. Here's Jesus, who I think, again, sees Matthew quite a bit and says, that's one of my guys. That's one of the guys I'm going to call to be a part of, of this ministry that, that God has called me to. And so Jesus goes to Matthew and invites him, and Matthew says, yep, I'll, I'll do this. But the crazy part is Matthew wasn't done at this point. When God comes to you or Jesus comes to you and is like, hey, this is what I want you to do, follow me, you know what you do? You follow Jesus, and then you throw a party. Look at verse 10. It says, later Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. Jesus says, follow me. Matthew says, that's exactly what I'll do. Hey, Jesus, why don't you come with the disciples you have and come and have dinner with me? Well, these guys get there, and there's some other dinner guests that are there too. As Matthew tells us here, tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. I think Matthew does this for, for a reason for Jesus. And I think it's to say, hey, Jesus, I want you to know who you're interacting with. I, I want you to know that like these, these are the people I work with. These are the people I know. These are the people that I have relationships with. Jesus, these are the people that are my friends. It's almost like you feel like Matthew's saying, are you, Jesus, are you okay with this based on the people that I am connected to? Well, the book of Mark and the book of Luke, they actually retell this story too, this event in the life of Matthew and Jesus. And I, I really love what Mark says in Mark chapter 2, verse 15. He puts this in parentheses, but I think I've missed this reading the story, but, but hit it again this past week. He says, there were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. Like, I think that's pretty important that Mark puts this in there. Because here's Mark who's really kind of adding to who Jesus connects with. That, that the group of people, the type of people that are at Matthew's house, these are the people that Jesus hung out with. These are the people that Jesus interacted with. These are the people that Jesus influenced. And these are the people that followed Jesus. And yet culture said, hey, Jesus, these are not the people that you should spend any time with. Let's look at verse 11. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? I like to use the New Living Translation for my Bible reading, and, and here on Sundays I just find it easier to read and easier to kind of uh, read through in a setting like this too. But that term scum that is used here in verse 11 is actually the exact same Greek word that's used in verse 10 when it talks about tax collectors and disreputable sinners. Now, here's what scum means. Scum just means a group of people who didn't follow Jewish rituals. This was a group of people that, that mostly didn't follow the rules and the regulations of the Jewish religious leaders, uh, particularly when it came to, uh, to purity and to things like, like tithing. But in that culture, who you ate with defined who you were. In fact, it not only defined who you were, it told everybody what social class you are a part of. And so culture said, eat with people that are just like you and don't stray from your social class. Think about Jesus, though. Jesus was known to be a rabbi. 
And so if you were a rabbi, then you hung out with people that were rabbis. You hung out with people that were just like you, that were part of that same social class as you. But here is, here's Jesus who doesn't care about that. He didn't care what you did for a living. He didn't care how much you made. He didn't care about your religious background. He didn't care about your ethnic background. He didn't care about your social class. Like when we see Jesus over and over in Scripture, we find that he eats with everyone. He eats with the outcast. He eats with the fringe. He eats with the lost. He eats with the scum. He even eats with the religious leaders. Jesus is definitely countercultural to that world at that time. And because of this, he has these incredible opportunities to be with people different than him, to hang out with people that were different than what everybody else said he should hang out with. And in those moments with them, so often over a meal, he's able to influence their lives, and they followed him. See, those religious leaders were appalled at his actions. Their theology said, hey, those are scum. Those are people you should stay away from. They're outsiders. They're unclean. Don't be around them. And so here in this moment at this dinner, they see this. They look at Jesus' disciples, and they ask that question. Why is he eating with that group of people? As I think about this part of this story for us, I think it means that love agents step out of their comfort zone. Think about the relationships that you have in your life right now. My guess is you probably have a comfort zone. That if you were to look at the people that you hang out with, they are just like you, right? Let's say you ride a Harley and you're tatted all up and down. Your favorite color is denim. You're probably not hanging out at Springfield Country Club, driving around in your BMW wearing pastel colors, right? I get it today. There's a little crossover. So you might have denim on today, and then tomorrow you can be in your pastels. I get that. But for the most part, we hang out and spend time with people that are just exactly like us. And so here is, is Jesus, and he's questioned about who he's spending time with because the people that are at this dinner party are so far out of the comfort zone of these religious leaders. But Jesus isn't there following cultural norms. Jesus is there to change lives. I think for those of us who are followers of Christ, it's really hard to step out of our comfort zone when it comes to people who are different than us. Like if you don't vote like me, if you don't think like me, if you don't behave like me, if you don't believe like me, if you don't speak like me, if you don't act like me, if you don't look like me, you know what? I'm not going to spend any time with you. I want to stay in my comfort zone. And when you and I end up staying in our comfort zones, I think we lose so many opportunities to influence the lives of other people. I, I love the way that Dave Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons put this in their book, Unchristian. They say it this way. They say the primary reason outsiders feel hostile towards Christians, and especially conservative Christians, is not because of any specific theological perspective. What they react negatively to is our swagger, how we go about things, and the sense of self-importance we project. You know, I see that term swagger there, and, and I think about how people who aren't followers of Christ see that in us. And you know what I think that is? I think it's fear. Like, we have fear to step out of this comfort zone that we've kind of built around us. And so much so that we fear any kind of interaction with someone who doesn't believe, behave, think, act, talk, just like you and I may, may live our own lives. There's this fear of being around other people that aren't like us. And so we build walls, we put up barriers due to this fear. And the sphere doesn't allow us to be the love agents that God has called us to be. But I'll even take it a, a step further here. Joel talked about this a, a little bit last week, that sometimes we're afraid of people that we care about and people that we know. Maybe it's family members or close friends, a, a child or a parent. And if they're not in our comfort zone, 
that we have a really hard time continuing or building that relationship with them too. Because again, they don't think, they don't believe, they don't act the same way that we do. And maybe sometimes that is the hardest group of people for us to show unconditional love to. Here in our story, these Pharisees see Jesus with this group of people that he's eating with, and that group of people are so far out of their comfort zone, and yet here's Jesus who's showing them, like, this is who you're supposed to be. This is what it looks like to understand who God is in your, your life. You were called to be love agents, and when we're called to be love agents, it means we step out of those comfort zones we may have. So why is this important? Look at verse 12. It says, when Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. If you go back to verse 11, the Pharisees ask that question of the disciples, and I'm pretty sure they ask it loud enough where Jesus hears it. And so here's Jesus who's responding to that question. And, and when he responds to that question, here in verse 12 and 13, I, I feel like these are a couple of digs that Jesus makes at the Pharisees. I mean, right here, when he talks about the healthy not needing a doctor, but the sick do, it's kind of like he's telling the Pharisees, hey, you, you guys, you think you got it all figured out. And you know what? Great for you. Then you don't need me. But you know who needs me? The sick, the outcasts, those that are the outsiders, the people that you put down, the people that are far from God. And maybe they're far from God just because of you and who you are. Jesus is like, I'm here for, for them. But then he continues on in verse 13. It says, then he added, now go and learn the meaning of the scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. The very first phrase Jesus uses there, now go, go and learn the meaning of this scripture. It was a teaching practice in those days. A teacher would come to a student or a group of students and say, hey, I want you to, to listen to this. And, and the reason they would start out this way is because they wanted the student to know that what I'm getting ready to tell you is really important, but I don't want to have a conversation about it right now. What I want you to do is take what I'm getting ready to tell you, and then I want you to go back, and I just want you to, I just want you to contemplate it. I just want you to meditate on it. I just want you to chew on it and think about it. And so here's Jesus, who's going to this group of teachers, right, these teachers of the law, the Pharisees, and he's like, I'm getting ready to tell you something that I want you to stop and think about. And then Jesus says this, I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. The Jewish Bible translation puts it this way, and I really like this, I want compassion more than animal sacrifice. Part of the tension here with Jesus and these Pharisees, it's not really their theology, it's the way they practice their theology. Their focus was more on the religious rituals of the day than it was over loving people. And so as Jesus is responding to that question, why is he eating with them? He's saying, hey, you're not living the life that God intended for you to live. You're not bringing these people closer to God. You're actually taking them further away from God. Start blessing them instead of putting these burdens on them. And so Jesus says, I want compassion more than I want animal sacrifice. Again, what's he doing? He's being countercultural. The culture, the religious culture said, no, it's all about the rituals and it's about animal sacrifices and it's about all, all this religion piece. And Jesus is like, your theology is okay and theology is good, but if you're not actually living it out in your life, then what, what is it really worth? He says, you're missing that part out or leaving that part out. And this is why the religious leaders didn't like him. They were so focused on their theology and their rituals that they really forgot how to love, <coughs> love other people. Here we have Jesus, though, <coughs> in this moment, having a meal with these outsiders. And what is he doing right here? He's showing them mercy, and he's showing them compassion. And he's showing them unconditional love. Jesus didn't care what they had done, but Jesus cared about who they were. And so if we're thinking of ourselves in this position of being a love agent, that means love agents love <clears throat> unconditionally. 
I love how uh, Judd Wilhite, he's a pastor at a church in Las Vegas, put it in his book, Pursued, God's Divine Obsession with You. He, he writes it this way. He says, his love, and this is God's, is so different from our love for one another. We love each other if, because, and when. If someone doesn't meet the standards for our love, doesn't come through for us, doesn't love us the way we think they should, then we withdraw and our love grows cold. And our hearts can be vindictive and become hard. God's love is in another category all by itself. His love is completely undeserved. God loves in spite of. As God's love agents to the world, we are called to step out of our comfort zone and to live this incredible life like we see through God's love for us. That no matter how different someone may be from us, no matter how undeserving we may think they are of our love, in spite of who they are or what they have done, we are called to love others unconditionally. Why? Because that's the way that God loves and yet, when we look at these Pharisees, we don't see that. They don't love unconditionally. Their love has condition. And so I'm not really sure that we're any different than those Pharisees. Then we begin to look at the relationships we have with the people that God puts in our life that so often we have conditions on that relationship too. And that fear comes and that comfort zone feels like it's being threatened. And again, we put up those walls and barriers around us and we get focused on our rituals, and we get focused on our methodologies, and we get focused on our theologies, and we don't end up loving the people that God has asked us to love. We don't end up loving the people that we see Jesus loving throughout his life. Remember what Jesus said? He said, the healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. As I was uh, working on this message over the past couple of weeks, uh, just thinking back to February, uh, my wife Kara has a, a can genetic um, condition with her hearing where she's losing her hearing because uh, her stapia in her inner ear began to calcify. And uh, so she was in for surgery on her right ear and crazy what they can do, they take out this little tiny bone, the stapia out of your inner ear and they put a prosthetic in and over a few months that, that hearing's supposed to come back. Probably not to fully where it should be, but at least back to, to where she can hear at a, a, a little bit more normal level. So we go to Fairfax Hospital, you know, way too early because they tell you to get there way too early. And um, we get there and they take us back to the pre-op room. And if you've ever been in the pre-op room before, it's basically got three walls. And, and then there's a curtain that they half-heartedly shut and open and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but we're sitting there and she's laying in the bed. We're waiting for them to take her back. And I'm sitting there in my, my chair beside her just doing some emails. And you can hear the conversations that are going on across the, the, the aisle there in the other two rooms across from us. Now, again, the curtains weren't fully shut, so I could see through both sides. But to our left, I, I look over, there's a gentleman in there. He's probably 55, uh, 60 years old. And um, the, the nurses and doctors come in every single room and, and ask the question, so, hey, what are we going to do for you today? And, and I hear him answer that, that question a couple of times. And he said, hey, you are... You're taking the rest of my colon out today. Uh, you've already taken most of it out, but it's time to get the rest of it out. And I heard that, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, my gosh, like, this guy is he's going through some things right now. He's, he's, he's struggling. This sounds like life or, or death, and I just can't imagine what he or his family were, were going through in that moment. Well, there's a lady, and I can't see her because of the curtain, but I, I hear the doctors and nurses come in ask the exact same question. Hey, what are we here to what are we here to do for you today? And she says, "I'm uh, I'm donating my kidney." And I'm sitting there thinking, "Wow, this is amazing!" And how different could these two situations be, right? There's this one guy who who I'm thinking in my mind like this is this is this is bad, and this could get worse pretty soon. And then there's this lady who's like, "I'm going to give my kidney to give someone else life." I'm thinking, "What what an incredible thing to be here and, and to kind of hear and experience." Well, they wheel these two back finally. We're still waiting. And uh, I hear this noise, and I know the noise 
I know exactly what it is, but I'm like, that is not a noise you should hear in a hospital. And, and the noise was chains uh, on the floor. And I'm thinking, maybe this is some new equipment and it's got chains on it. Uh, maybe they're practicing for a Christmas carol for December. I don't know what they're doing here. But I'm sitting there, and the next thing you know, because, again, the curtains were open a little bit on both sides, I, I see these two sheriff's deputies, and in between them is a, a prisoner in his jumpsuit. His wrists are chained together. His ankles are chained together, and there's a chain between his wrists and his ankles, and that noise I knew I knew were his chains as he's shuffling to his pre-op room. I don't know what was going on there, but I had a lot of different thoughts going on in, in my head. But as, I, as I'm sitting there and I'm experiencing all these different things on this particular day, it, it, it really kind of takes me back to what Jesus says right here, right? This is why a hospital exists. It, it exists to help the guy and maybe even save his life by having his colon removed. It exists for this lady to give her kidney so that she can give life to someone else. It exists for this prisoner that some of us may say, hey, they shouldn't get any help whatsoever, but it exists to help him with whatever medical condition he was going through, no matter what he had done in his life. It exists to give my wife hearing back in her ears once again. And I think about the hospital and what it's there for. It's not there for the healthy hospital is there for the sick. And then I think about the men and the women and the doctors and the nurses and everybody who works at a hospital and all the love and compassion and mercy that they have to have for so many people. People that are so different in many ways to who they are. And I think about Jesus' words there it's not the healthy that need a doctor, it's the sick, and it, the sick, and it, it takes me back to that interaction Jesus has with Matthew. And here he is with Matthew and Matthew's friends. And what does Jesus do? Jesus expresses this love and this mercy, and this compassion to this group of people over something as simple as a meal. He doesn't stop and say, hey, why don't you guys come to church with me on Sunday? He doesn't say, hey, why don't you jump into my small group on Wednesday nights? He doesn't say, hey, I've got this really good Christian book I want you to read, and then maybe we can talk through it. Jesus doesn't do any of that. He stops, and he has a meal with Matthew and his friends. Like, I, I'm trying to put myself in there, and I tell you guys to do this all the time. Put yourself in, into that moment. Maybe you're there at that dinner table. Can you imagine the conversations that are happening in that place? Like, these guys are asking Jesus questions. And Jesus was a great teacher, so what did he do? He always asked questions back. I don't think he lectures them. I don't think he's sitting there trying to teach them some moral lesson. I don't even think that he's, he's sitting there even judging them, right? He's not judging them, telling them, hey, you're horrible people. He's not doing that at all. He's just listening and asking questions and interacting. And I bet it was really loud, and I bet there was a ton of laughter, and I bet you there were some naughty words that were shared because being a pastor, they'd have been like, oops, sorry, Jesus, really trying to work on that right now. But, but there's just this incredible moment at this dinner time together. And what happens through that? Jesus influences their lives. And at least for Matthew, we know he influenced his life for eternity. To the point of that Matthew is willing to give his life later on because of who Jesus was for him in his life. And I'm thinking that the reason he's able to do that is because Jesus stopped, and just took a moment to eat a meal with Matthew and his friends. Like, to me, that's an incredible example of unconditional love. And so as you and I, as we think about what we've read here with, with Jesus and Matthew and this dinner party and the Pharisees, my guess is we've got some things to work on. But as we continue this Love Agents series, part of this is to give you this mission to, to live out. And so 
There's two parts to this. One piggybacks on last week. The first thing I would say to you is who's on your hit list? Like, as you've been praying, who's that person that God is putting on your mind and in your heart that you're like, ugh, I don't really want to do this. This is going to take me out of my comfort zone. I don't really know if I like this person. But I promise you, if you're praying this prayer for God to show you who this person is, and that name, that face keeps popping up, that is the person God is telling you, hey, it's time for you to spend a few moments with him. And so once you know who that person is, that, that next step in this mission this week, if you so choose to accept it, is for you to invite them to a meal. Now, maybe you invite them to coffee, maybe you invite them over for a drink, maybe you invite them to grill, whatever it may be for you, but, but you just take a moment, and you're just like, I'm just going to invite this person. And here's what God will do to that. God is going to use you in amazing ways in their life. You don't know. This person that God has put on your heart may be going through some of the toughest stuff in their life, and you just don't even know it yet. And yet, through that moment of being with them and interacting with them, God's going to use you to influence their lives, maybe for a moment, and maybe for eternity. So we've got to be willing to step out of our comfort zone and to express that mercy and that compassion and that unconditional love for them, like Jesus did for Matthew and his friends, and like God has done for you and for me. Thank you.